You know, we're, we're talking about King David. I'm super excited that Chuck has decided to do a sermon series about my life. And uh, I'm just playing. But you ought to come to church with me sometime. There you go. Hey, but I am I'm super excited about being here. Probably more excited than I usually am because about two weeks ago, my wife had a baby. And, uh, it's, uh, it's always exciting when it's someone else's baby, right? Because you guys still get to sleep. And, and I say it that way purposely. My wife had the baby. I just stood there and watched, okay? I didn't have a whole lot to do with this. But so we're in that weird phase of life. This is our third little boy. And so little baby, his name's George Lewis, um, after my grandfather's. Um, he hates sleep at night. All day he'll sleep. So I am running um, on caffeine right now. That seventh cup of coffee just hit, so I'm vibrating. And so two, one of two things is going to happen. I'm either going to like speed read through this whole thing, or about halfway through, I'm just gonna, it's going to wear off, and I'm going to pass out. And you guys feel free to go lunch. I'll leave when I wake up. Um, but it's, it's crazy being a parent of uh, three boys. Sometimes William is a two-year-old. He likes the baby as long as mom and dad's not holding the baby. And then as soon as one of us picks him up, he loses his mind. And then my oldest freaks out because he can't handle the noise. And that wakes up the baby, and he starts screaming. And uh, I've mowed the yard seven times this week. And uh, sometimes you just got to get out. And, but my yard looks good. But let's, let's talk a little bit about parenting. I'm going to talk about expectation versus reality. Uh, before I became a parent, I was the perfect parent. I had everything lined up, exactly how I would do things, the discipline, you know, the, the schedule of the, of the life of things we're going to do. And to those of you who don't have kids, you don't know this yet, but all that pre-parenting mindset and planning, it doesn't work. Um, it just goes out the door as soon as that first baby enters the world. It doesn't even wait. Like, you don't even get out of the delivery room until your world just gets rocked, Okay. Now, you've, you're, you've seen this. If you've not experienced it, you've seen this. You've seen kids at like Walmart just lose their minds on the floor, freaking out. I always said, if I ever, my kid ever does it, I'm going to snatch him up. I'm going to end it right there. But it didn't happen that way. Uh, when it happened to me, I promise you it was an out-of-body experience. Okay? I saw what was happening. It was my oldest. This was, he was probably three, four years old. We're at Walmart because this only happens at Walmart. You know, it doesn't happen at any other store, and it doesn't happen on the empty aisles. You have to wait till you're on the aisle where all of Columbia is jammed, and then they just have like a Chernobyl-level meltdown. Well, Ben is on the floor. I don't even remember what's, what he's mad about, but his arms and legs are moving in every direction at the same time, and he's making the loudest noise known to man. And it just takes me a minute. And I realize, that's my kid. No one's coming to help me. So you get that panic, right? You're like, oh, my gosh. And you look up, and all everybody's looking at you like, what are you going to do? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've never done this before. But uh, what I did was brilliant, okay? And once you, you guys can steal this, especially if you're not a parent, write this down. It works. It's perfect. Okay, so I walk around the front of my cart, and everybody's looking at you with that judgmental, like, take care of your business look. And so I reached down, and I, I put my hand on Benjamin, and I said, are you okay, bud? And uh, didn't work. And so what I said next, I had to say loud enough for everybody in the aisle to hear so they know that I'm in control. And this is where the brilliance comes in. I said, where are your parents? <laughs> and the fit stopped immediately. And he looked at me like, what? And everybody's judgment look went from judgment to like, oh, that's so sweet. And so I couldn't stop there. I was already in. You don't act like you never ate, pretended not to know your kids. <laughs> but then, so I pick him up and I said, let's go to the front. I'll help you find them. So I grab him. We go to the front. I left an entire cart of groceries on aisle nine. We went to the car and went home. <laughs> so somebody with that shopping list went to that aisle and was like, jackpot. It's already done. So I didn't, that's not the way I had seen that going in my mind when I saw it happen to other people. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you're hanging out with your own kids, you think, 
if you weren't my kid, you wouldn't even be my friend. Anybody else think that before? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, that sounds much worse than it is. But you just realize at some point, you're, you'll see stuff that your kids do, and you think, this is not going to be good later in life. And I see that a lot with my kids. But no one ever prepares you for this side of parenting. They tell you about the good stuff, right? Oh, the first time they walk, it's going to be just amazing. And it's cool. It is neat. But then they don't tell you that something happens in a kid's brain at about 7.30 p.m., and they turn into absolute psychopaths. It's ridiculous. What we call Benjamin Destructor. There is nothing you can hand him that he cannot break. It's ridiculous. My two-year-old William, we call him Terror Tot because he is like a hurricane. It's crazy. And my parents, they set me up for failure, okay? They didn't tell me how hard parenting is. So the reality of parenting is totally different than what I expected parenting to be. And today we're going to be in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to look at some expectation versus reality because what people expected to happen didn't happen, and the reality was, was totally different, which has been the story of my life most of the time. And but we're going to talk, we're going to catch up with King David here, okay? King David is on the throne. He secured the, the, the throne of Israel, and he's going to do something here. He's going to keep a promise that he made back in, in 1 Samuel. I think it was chapter 20. But let's, let's pick up with old, with old David, who's named after me. Um, that's how this works. Actually, my email address is the David Carr, because that's me. Anyway, I'm getting my caffeine has got me, guys. Here we go. 2 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 7. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, the kindness of God, to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is, the, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then David said, David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, to Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face to pay homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. So he's found the guy. He's found a, someone who belongs to the bloodline of Saul. And what he does next, he tells us what he intends to do. He intends to show the kindness of God to Mephibosheth or anyone from the bloodline of Saul. That's not what he was supposed to do as the king. Typically, what happens is, you know, David was not of the bloodline of Saul. So when you ascend to a throne and you're not of the throne's bloodline, you're supposed to kill everybody of that bloodline because you don't want your the former king's sisters, brothers, uncles, former roommate, twice removed, to come by and make a claim to the throne to say you're an illegitimate king. So the only way to secure your spot, if you don't come from that blood, is just to kill everybody. And so when he calls in old Ziba, which is an interesting name, but I was interested in Mephibosheth, but Ziba probably thinks, all right, he's going to try to track down. The wars have calmed down. Things are going great. Now it's time to kill everybody that belongs to Saul. But he says, I want to show him the kindness of God. You see, David was anointed king by God while Saul was still king. And then David becomes best friends with Jonathan, the rightful heir to the throne. And David patiently waits until God's time to raise him to the throne. But he makes that promise to Jonathan. He said, I'm going to show kindness to the house of Saul when I, be when I become king instead of just killing everybody. Well, this so happens that Mephibosheth is his best friend's son. Mephibosheth comes into the throne room thinking, this is it. I'm going to die. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill my kids. Uh, we had a good run, but here's the end. And he falls down prostrate, laying on the ground before the king, expecting death. 
And this is what David says to him instead. We'll go to 7 and 8. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should re show regard for a dead dog such as I? So David's expression here, it's, it's more than just a, a demonstration of a promise kept. It's a demonstration of a love undeserved. It's a, it's a demonstration of the kindness that God had shown to David, that he's now showing to Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth, we first meet him when Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle early in 1 Samuel. And Meshebaphes, whatever that guy's name is, his nanny grabs him and takes off running and trips and falls, and it breaks the baby's legs, Mephibosheth's leg, and he never heals correctly. He's not able to walk anymore. So he's, he's crippled, and he's supposed to be being killed by David. Now, we have a, we, sometimes we mistake, we make a mistake, and we think that kindness shows weakness. I had an NCO in the army that, uh, he was a really nice guy, and so I like to push him as far as I could just to see how much I could actually get away with. And he called me into his office one time, and he said, never mistake my kindness for weakness. And uh, I didn't take it to heart until I pushed too far, and I found out exactly what that meant. And I can't repeat to you the rest of the story because we're in polite company, and it was, it was crazy. But we have, a, we have a thing in our society where if we're just kind to people, we're seen as weak. But David, the most powerful king on the planet at the time, decided to show kindness. His words, it wasn't just some kind of a token gesture. It was, it was symbolic of the, of the love he had for Jonathan. It was symbolic of, of the love he had for God. Mephibosheth did not deserve to be elevated to the king's table. Now, we kind of lost what that means in our modern culture. And what it means, when you sit at the king's table, whenever there's like a state event, you know, and you see all the world leaders sitting at that table, if you were a, a, of the king's family during a, a big event, um, a visiting embassy or whatever, the time, all the king's family would sit at one big long table to show that you had honor, respect, and authority in the kingdom of God. So Mephibosheth went from expecting to die because he was related to Saul, to now sitting in a place of authority and prominence within the kingdom of Israel. But it also meant that Mephibosheth was going to be getting a pension to live off of for the rest of his life. So David elevated this man to a place of respect and authority. Can you imagine the relief this dude felt? Can you imagine sitting on the ground expecting that the king's going to kill you at any moment? And instead, he invites you to sit at his table and become a son to him. That is exactly what Christ did for us. You see, when we fail, we became, what it says in Romans 5, enemies of God. Because we can relate to God as father or judge. But if we don't relate to God as father, then we're relating to his enemy, the devil, as father. And when we are enemies of God, we deserve death. It says it in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So what Jesus did is, is exactly what David did to Mephibosheth. He came to a broken outcast someone who deserved to die, and he elevated them to a spot at the king's table. But that's not where he stopped. You know, that was good enough, right? That was, that was I think that's pretty good. You let me live. But see, David showing us an aspect of Father God where he will restore to us all the things we've lost in our sin. All of those broken relationships, all of the 
all the times that all the time we've wasted being depressed and, and miserable in life, God will restore it. Because we have a seat at his table. Now I suspect here that David's words here changed Mephibosheth's life. We don't realize sometimes the depth of impact we have when we're just kind to people. When you are kind to that moron at work whose voice just makes you want to drop kick them. Do you guys have that person too? I think, I don't know how that works, but every corporation seems to have one. And there's certain people in life that you can just hear their voice and your, t- your spine tightens up. And you're praying, Jesus, give me peace, because if you give me strength, I'm going to need bail money. You guys ever prayed that prayer? <laughs> me and one other person. Thank you. I'm not alone. But David later on writes in Psalms, he says, when we show kindness to our enemies, it's like pouring hot coals on their head. Have you guys, I have a little brother. I am a little brother. I have a little brother. And sometimes we would just pick on my little brother to make him mad. Do you guys ever do that? Okay. My family's weird, I know. But we would just aggravate the fire out of this kid. Because it was funny when he was, he would lose his cool. He'd blow up. But eventually my dad got through to him, and he started just letting it roll off his back. And us trying to make him mad and him not getting mad made us mad. So eventually we just stopped. So when we have people who are coming at us, right, someone who is at work who's trying to undercut you or someone who's always rude, if we respond to them with with kindness, it changes the dynamic of the relationship because it shows one of two things. One, 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 two things. It shows two things. One, first thing it shows is we're not going to get down to your level. You're not going to bring me down to that muck you hang out in. Secondly, and probably and definitely more importantly, it shows that we have a higher authority who shows goodness no matter what you do to me. So let's look, let's continue here and let's see what else David does for o, o Phoebe. 2 Samuel 9, 9 through 11. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul... To all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him, shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all the Lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. David just didn't spare his life. He restored to him all that Saul owned. This is huge. He went, Mephibosheth went from from nothing, crippled, unable to provide for his family, to now owning everything that the previous king owned. Plus, he was given servants and people to work for the fields so that he didn't have to do anything. They would bring the produce of the land to him. I mean, this is like having your rich uncle die, leave you his inheritance, and then going and winning the lottery all on the same day. This guy has now, he's got it made. But he restored to him from a place in the wilderness to a place at the king's table. Now, why would David do this? David didn't have to do this. Why does the king of heaven adopt us? He didn't have to do that. He could have just wiped us all out and started over. Because of the loving kindness of God, we're able to show the loving kindness of God to others. We've been shown kindness to God because he's given us the opportunity to get to know him to separate ourselves from the world, from everything that is against God, and 
come into his presence. And it wasn't cheap. There's no such thing as cheap grace. It cost God his very life. So when, when Christ came, you guys will notice as you read through the Gospels, Christ didn't come as judge. Christ had every right to come down, incarnate, become a man, and just judge. But instead of doing that, he came in loving kindness. And he taught us what the kingdom of heaven is like. Not only what it's like, but how we can all partake in it. Regardless of what we've done. Regardless of all the junk in our lives. Jesus said, I, I will pave the way. And if you believe in me, I will give you the power to become children of God. So that's John chapter 1. Some translations say, I'll give you the right to become children of God. So we don't have to face God as judge. We can face God as Father. He has invited us to sit at his banquet at the king's table. So what would happen in our daily lives if we followed David's example here? What if we just showed the kindness of God to everybody? What if we stopped labeling people by the sins they commit? What if we stopped calling someone a drug addict, drug addict and just labeled them loved by God? What if we, we stopped making snap judgments about people because their skin's a different color and just realized and labeled them children of God, image of God? How would our lives be different? How would your household be? be different, your work, your schools, how would they be different? How would, it re how would your reaction to someone be, if, be different if you looked at them the way that God sees them? I ask myself this question all the time. You know, I'm human, and there's people on this planet I just don't like. You know, You've all got the people. You ever met somebody and you didn't even talk to them yet? You just knew you didn't like them? Not yet? No? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. God made us all different. We're all different personalities. We all have different interests. We're not supposed to get along with everybody. We're supposed to love everybody. So if we show loving kindness, that means that we have to approach people with the love of God and let the judgment of God belong to the judge and stop trying to take over his job. We've, we've got a bad habit of uh, kind of scooching in on the judgment seat sometimes. You ever, ask, you ever go and just tell God, hey, you're in my chair. Let, let me judge this one. We do it all the time, don't we? When we make judgments about people, we're taking over God's job and not doing what God told us to do. God told us, don't worry about what they're doing, what sins they have in their lives. You worry about showing them my love and my kindness, and I'll deal with all of that. But God can't deal with their sin until they see his love. That's what the Great Commission is all about. We are the, we are the reflection of God's love, and we reflect it by letting, allowing God to work in our lives by accepting God's love and kindness in our own lives, letting it change us first and not telling people they need to change, but then showing them, look, this is how I change. One of the, uh, the kids don't say this anymore, but when I was growing up, people would say, know your role. We got to know where we fit in. And our place is not to make the judgments that God has reserved for himself. Mephibosheth gave, was given a new identity and a new position in the kingdom. 2 Corinthians says that for those who are in Christ Jesus, the old is gone and the new has come. 
you are not the same person you were before you got saved. Your personality is the same, but where you get your character is different. Your character is no longer grounded in whatever you see fit best. Your character is now grounded in the very word of God, in the creator of the universe. That's where your character is now grounded. And God's character is kindness. He has to be kind. He can't be any other way. Because if he was anything but kind, it would contradict his character and disqualify him from being God. So our job is to show people what that's like. Taking hold of our new position in the kingdom of God. You know, it's crazy to think that David restored all of Saul's land and property to this grandson. David just did this act of kindness because of his love for Jonathan and his love for God. David took in someone that most of us spend our whole lives trying to avoid. You know, the downtrodden, the outcast, the, the people who are crushed emotionally and spiritually. And a lot of times we try to avoid them because we don't want to get sucked into their junk, right? But Jesus spent all of his time with the people that I've spent my whole life trying to avoid. And I have to think sometimes, God, why do you allow me to do what I do when I'm so bad with your kingdom? You know, sometimes I think God will place, and I know this, God will place someone in your life who's broken because they need to see the scars of where you've been put back together. You know, several years ago, and I've told most of you, if not all of you, this story, my wife divorced me, <laughs> mainly because I'm a jerk, and I don't hide it at home. But <laughs> someone said true. That was awesome. They've been at my house. But what happened was I was actually my first year of Bible college. I was trying to get my start in ministry. I was trying to get my degree in ministry. And my wife was trying to get me divorced. So I was trying to hold all this stuff together. The only thing I successfully did was stay in college. And, but I would, I would work on it, and I would work on it, and it would get worse, and it would get worse, and it would get worse. And I would say, you know what, God, you just, you take it, because everybody says, you know, give it to God, right? You got to work it out. It's really easy to say. Okay, so I would give it to God, and then he would start taking it a whole other direction. I'm like, hey, fella, hang on. Stop it. You know, and I would start working on it again. It would keep getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, guys, I gave up. I was like, you know what? Forget it. I know it's hard to be in ministry, start ministry as a divorced guy, but, you know, this is what God wants me to do. This is what I'm going to do. Whatever you do, I'm cool with it. And I promise you guys, it was within a week. It was Sunday night. My wife started sending me pictures of my son. It was like two or three at the time. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, she used to send me one or two pictures that she would get the repute of him. But this was like repeated pictures. She sent me like 12, 15 pictures. And I'm like, this is weird. So I text back, hey, thanks for the pics. You know, kept watching my movie. And then she sends me a text, and the text says, do you think God could make us a family again? And I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and God, when I was able to release myself and accept God's loving kindness, he restored to me all that I had lost in my son. My wife and I have been married 10 years in February. This coming February. And I tell people all the time, like the second, third year, I think she forgot my name. Because every time I said something to her, she'd go, Jesus. So I'm pretty sure she forgot my name for that whole year. But God is a God of restoration. I know in a crowd this size, there's people in this room who have gone to church, they've been really highly active in church, and then you just kind of walked away from it. I did the same thing. There's no starting over with God. He wants to restore you and restore all the stuff that you lost. 
in your sin. And he does that. He gives us that grace. He shows us that kindness so that we can then go and show people, this is how good my God is. This is what he did for me. Sometimes you got to be like, you see that scar? That hurt. But God. There's a reason why God allows us to get scars, and I love that. So in every walk in life, it's, it's important. You know, I grew up in Arkansas, and there's a maxim we use. I forgot to share this for first service, and you, we have a lot of Texas folk. They might say this in Texas too, but they say, hug your friends tight and your enemies tighter. Hug them so they can't wiggle. Right? And that's the way we got to do. That's what God does for us. God, when we were very enemies of God, he held us so tight we couldn't wiggle loose. And he died for us. And so what I want us to remember about this is that the greatest thing that one can do for God is to show kindness to his other children. If you do nothing else for God, just show the kindness he's shown to you to the rest of his kids. You know, when Jesus told his disciples one time, love your neighbor, they said, who's your neighbor? Let me tell you something. Everybody's his kids. And it doesn't matter what they do to you. It's about what God's done for you. Then we show them that kindness so that God can come in and work on the sin of their lives. You know, kindness originates from the heart of God. Kindness is shown through our lives because that's who God is. And we have a misconception of God in our culture that God is some angry dude in the sky that just wants everybody to go to hell. But that's not it. And it hurts me that he's portrayed that way because the God that I know and the God that I love is kind and gentle. And he's, he's there in every situation. So as you guys are, are living each day, let your character be rooted in God. And let God's kindness be shown through you in every action, every word, every step that you take. You know, your, your words and actions have a massive effect on the environment around you. You can speak life or you can speak death. And I want you to look at it this way. Every day, you've got two buckets in your hands. This one's filled with water and this one's filled with gasoline. And when somebody around you is spiraling out of, out of control and the, the fire is starting con to consume them, you've got to choose which bucket you're going to use. Are you going to put the fire out and show them the loving kindness of God? Or are you going to add to the pain and watch them burn? We have to figure out that God has asked us to show his kindness to his children. So in every situation, I ask you to bring dignity with your words and actions and don't demoralize the situation. You know, if you guys would stand with me, just got one last thought for you that we've kind of addressed, but you know, all this stuff that, that David did for Mephibosheth is the exact same thing God has done for us. And I can tell you right now that God does not care where you've been what you've done or what label society or the church has put on you. Because God has labeled you his child. And that's the only label that matters. So wherever you are this morning concerning your relationship with God, I want you to know that God's opinion of you has not changed. 
that he can and will restore you to the king's table. So if you guys would bow your heads with me. If you are not a Christ follower, if you have not accepted your invitation to the king's table, I want to give you a chance this morning. And I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy. All I want you to do is just simply put your hand, raise your hand in the air, and we're going to say a prayer together. So if you would like to become a Christ follower this morning, to be restored to God's table, if you guys would just raise your hand. Thank you, guys. I see your hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is amazing. There's hands going up everywhere. So let's, let's pray together. And those of you who raised your hands, I want us to pray. And I want you to make this prayer your prayer and personal between you and God. So Father, thank you that you have chosen to restore me. That you have labeled me your child. Father, from this day forward, I will live and serve at your table as a child in your kingdom. Thank you for restoration. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we welcome them into the family real quick? There was, that was amazing. There were people everywhere. For those of you that raised your hands, uh, if you want some more information about getting started in this, grab me, grab Pastor Chuck, grab one of our leaders. We'd love to just visit with you, get you going on your road, and uh, we're always here for you. But I want to pray for everybody real quick. So let's pray just that we will be able to show the kindness of God. Father, thank you that you came down and you showed kindness to me when I didn't deserve it. <clears throat> that I was the outcast, that I was the broken and the, the weary and the weak. God, but you came down in your loving kindness and you restored me to my position beside you. And Father, I pray that we would go from this place and show your kindness to all of your children. That we would not take your seat on the judgment throne, but we would be your hands and feet <coughs> showing people that you are good. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.